Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Monday afternoon. I was just about to say Wednesday, so sorry. No, it is Monday afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before we get started, I'll just remind you to please silence any phone or anything else that you might have that makes noise. If you would silence that, please, we would appreciate it. Um, we'll have the lecture today and then we'll have time for Q&A. You can ask the question, I'll use the microphone so everyone can hear it, or you can come up and talk with Carl Brown afterwards if you have questions for him. But let's go ahead and get started. My name is Carrie Bourne. I work for the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we have partnered with Fairhaven Senior Services here since 1983 to bring you lectures um, from our very talented faculty and staff. Um, this year we are celebrating 40 years of doing this program, so thank you for having us. We really love being here. And in celebrating the 40 years of the lecture series, uh, we've invited some of our very best faculty and staff and, and programs, award-winning individuals and groups um, to just really... <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, and, and it's just the best of the best to come talk with you. And um, today's presenter is no exception. He is Dr. Carl Brown. He's an associate professor in the Department of History at UW-Whitewater. He is the recipient of the Everett and Ellen Long Award for the Advancement of General Education Programs at UW-Whitewater and the David Saunders Award for Teaching in the Humanities. And he is a past Fulbright Scholar to Hungary. So, yeah, he's one of a couple things. <laughs> he received his PhD and MA from the University of Texas at Austin and his BA from Lawrence University in Appleton. His current research focuses on the transnational Cold War and prohibition in Wisconsin. In addition to his teaching and research work at several institutions in the U.S., Dr. Brown has worked in breweries in Japan and Greece and on a fishing boat in Alaska. He lives here in Whitewater with his wife, Brianne, and their children, Margaret and Nels. Please welcome Dr. Carl Brown. Thank you, Carrie. And folks, can we take a moment to thank Carrie for all her hard work putting this program together? She's been doing this for ages. Carrie, thanks so much for having me back again. Um, let's see, let me start my timer so I don't run out. There we are, good. Okay, what I would like to uh, share with you today is a topic that I've just begun researching that I kind of stumbled across in the course of other work. So I'm, I'm actually gonna talk you through uh, my process of getting to this topic before I address the roughly 6,000 year history of humankind and a uh, plant disease, the stem rust of, uh, of cereal crops. We obviously have to step back and take kind of a running start at this, so let me bear with you, so, so bear with me as I explain how I came to this project in the first place, okay? Now, as Kerry mentioned, I'm working on the transnational Cold War, looking at things like propaganda, broadcasting, and various other ways the Cold War was waged, um, not with troops or guns, but with the battle for hearts and minds, right? So, one thing I found um, was a program by Radio Free Europe in the 1950s to um, send aloft these basically weather balloons filled with pamphlets to send them over um, o o o over the Iron Curtain. And then, let's see, I have a picture of one somewhere. Here we are. The, the, these boxes were loaded with a block of dry ice that as it evaporated, um, it would get to a point where the bins would dump over and dump these pamphlets all over the countryside, right? This just struck me as such a weird idea. I had to look into it some more. Um, because, again, for, for, for broadcasting, for the most part, we think about radio broadcasting, right? There's what types of messages do we try to send across the Iron Curtain? How do we convince people that our way of life is better? Um, but for the most part, people don't look at this. Uh, I'm one of the first people to look at this leaflet campaign, okay? And it was a big deal. Uh, in August of 1951 alone, over 11 million leaflets were balloon cast, dropped on top of Czechoslovakia. A similar program for Hungary takes place in uh, uh, between 54 and 56. This is uh, Operation Vito and Operation Focus, or the two top secret CIA names for this, of course. The premise, again, is we launch the balloons from the western side of the Iron Curtain. They get to a cruising altitude. At some point, that dry ice uh, melts, tips the box, and the pamphlets scatter across the ground, spreading the good word of democracy and capitalism to the so-called captive, captive peoples behind the Iron Curtain, right? Um, 
So as I got into looking at this uh, topic, I mean, it, it's hard to say how successful or unsuccessful it was, right? I mean, some uh, people in Eastern Europe uh, reported seeing some of these pamphlets. Uh, some of them digested some of their content. But what I discovered as I dug into it further was that the, um, there was a domestic counterpart to this program as well. That is, the people, the, 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 the culprits, or the people responsible are Radio Free Europe, who are uh, paid, who are under a larger corporation, the Free Europe Committee, which is getting all kinds of money from the CIA to wage psyops, uh, uh, psychological warfare against our communist foes. And one of the things they wanted to do was they, they wanted to raise money for the Cold War at home. So even as we're launching these balloons across the Iron Curtain, trying to spread messages of hope and democracy to peoples uh, in Eastern Europe, we're also using the exact same uh, technology and tactics at home to convince people to dig down in their pockets and support the Cold War. Give us donations to continue this program going in Eastern Europe, and we can, and um, you can put your name on a telegraph blank, put it in one of these balloons, whoever finds it will send it back to you. Right? It's a sort of, a, a, in essence, a domestic fundraising counterpart to the psychological warfare. Balloons are being used in both cases, both, to get both against uh, Eastern Europeans living under communist rule and Americans who need to be persuaded to cough up some money to help the Cold War. Fighting the Cold War isn't cheap. Freedom isn't free. All right? Um, so this took a number of forms that, uh, that there was a, sort of the, these motorcades that would crisscross the countryside with replica Liberty Bells and uh, pass, passing out uh, pamphlets uh, with, a, a, with a message that they're trying to promulgate in Eastern Europe. And then again, um, the, the, <laughs> the most striking document I found was a set of instructions for these people who were in charge of the motorcades. And their instructions read like a primer written by P.T. Barnum, right? They talk about you should you plant somebody in the crowd to be the first one to jump up and, and buy one, you know, play some schmaltzy music to encourage people to, 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 to buy in and support the Cold War which I think makes us ask some interesting questions about advertising, propaganda, public diplomacy, brainwashing. But the, the, the point here, the po and at the heart of the article that I'm publishing uh, soon, whenever I finish writing it, is how we deploy the same technology abroad and at home. The former case for propaganda, the second for fundraising, right? This is all by way of explaining how I stumbled across today's topic, which is, um, let's see, there's a very tired-looking Dr. Carl Brown at the National Archives in College Park after a week of intensive research in the stacks. And there is the document that I stumbled across, kind of buried in a bunch of other content from a conference at Princeton in 2000. And it was this, uh, a CIA report, uh, top secret until it was declassified in 1989, um, and it's the pattern of land use in relation to target grains in the USSR and the probable spread of stem rust on cereal grains. And all the government documents you look for, seeing what the CIA's up to any given weekend with the brainwashing or their uh, various other conspiracy type stuff, you don't expect to see any mention of uh, plant disease and that as an element of crop biowarfare. Now, um, I said that it... Um, the reason that I, that I seized upon this is that my dad was a plant scientist uh, who worked overseas for years and years. Here he is outstanding in his field in northern Thailand. And so just basically because dad would have wanted me to, I went ahead and called and <laughs> went ahead and filled out a request slip for that report. And this led me down the rabbit hole that I'm going to ask you all to follow uh, with me today. That is, what does some, how does stem rust, a, a, a crop disease, how is this, how is it a good idea possibly to look into using this to bombard the Eastern Bloc? That, that was the question I approached it with. More broadly though, what, what does this have to do with the Cold War or what do plant diseases have to do with history more broadly? So I got to thinking and I'll ask you a question. Hopefully it's not a hard one. Can anybody think of any previous examples or cases in which plant diseases have mattered in history? Tops anybody's hats. Oh, I'm going to come back. <laughs> Steal my thunder. Slow down there. Um, who likes potatoes? Okay, <laughs> thank you, right? So, I mean, just to, one example is, I mean, the, the, the potato famine in the 1840s, uh, this, the, the, the population of Ireland was 8 million in 1841. It was 6 million in 1851. Million die, million come to this country uh, to, to begin new lives, right? 
So th this is just one case in which um, a plant disease had a profound impact on uh, demographics and immigration, among other historical trends, right? Now, Don, you were talking about the, uh, the Salem witch trials. Do you, want, did, did, uh, did you remember that story? Right, ergot or ergotism, it turns out that rye, among other grains, uh, there's a particular disease of rye uh, called ergot, which has a chemical composition similar to that of LSD. Uh, so historians have gone back and looked at the climate around Salem around, uh, around 1692, and also around witch trials in Europe in the, the centuries previous, and they found that in some cases the weather conditions were, uh, would have been conducive to this type of disease growing on crops. It's entirely possible that people were hallucinating in Salem in 1692, and that's one explanation for all of the, uh, all of the, uh, the, 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 the strange things that happened there. So, plant diseases matter. Is my, is my first argument here. And let's go and get into stem rust. This is a, a disease of cereal grains, primarily barley in this country. Um, the reason, okay, so that, and it is, it is, it, it devastates crops in this country around the turn of the century into the 19 teens, okay? We've got, um, uh, it is unique in that it is a heteroecious plant disease. If there's one word you learn today, that's the one, heteroecious. And that means that it overwinters on the barberry bush. That is, the, 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 this is a, uh, the, whereas many plant disease cycles go simply through within the one plant host, this is a plant disease that'll overwinter on the barberry, so that in the spring, when planters crop their cereal crop, when planters plant their cereal crops next to it, then they, 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 they'll get infested almost straight away, right? This is, um, whereas most plant diseases work from year to year, this is a sort of a, a cyclic, almost a, a, a perennial plant disease, if you will. Right? So it overwinters on the barberry bush. This is a heteroecious cycle, the way it works. And um, we have, when, we, when I started digging into the history of stem rust and, mankind, and humankind, we go right back to the, the, the Yarmo site in what is today Iraq. 4,000 years ago, excavated in the 1950s, when you could still do excavations in the Middle East without um, all the various problems with that today. And, we f and uh, scientists found on pot sherds at this site um, Puccina griminis, stem rust. As going back to 4000 BC, we have uh, a, a paleobotanical evidence of this disease being present in crops these, these 6,000 years ago, right? The Romans knew about stem rust. They had, there was an entire festival dedicated to, to it, the Rubiglia, where you would have sacrifices and foot races to appease uh, the, the god Robigus, who would otherwise curse your crops with this disease, stem rust, right? Uh, and th th this is from an account from Ovid from, uh, from 43, uh, uh, 43 uh, BCE. Not surprisingly, the surge that uh, Robigalia uh, for the Romans is appropriated by the church as the uh, days of rogation, also 25th of April. These are uh, ceremonies in which crops are blessed. Uh, that is, the, the early church is famous for appropriating previous pagan ceremonies and turning them into Christian ceremonies, and this is just one case of that. The thing is that stem rust is a persistent presence in um, human society from the very earliest archaeological times up through the Roman Empire, up through the early church, and then um, into the present. So the obvious question is that if people know that the barberry bush is one of the things making their crops sick, why do they keep growing it? The answer is that the barberry is a very, very useful plant. Now, even though, the, the, okay, we have some early, the, the earliest case of it actually being banned uh, comes from uh, Rouen, France in 1660, but this is a super useful plant, okay? The berries are good, uh, for are, are, uh, are flavorful and tasty. Uh, the wood of the plant can be used for tool handles and other uh, implements like that. Uh, the berries, roots, and leaves all have medicinal uses, uh, knowledge of which dates back to 650 BCE. Um, they make good hedges, you know, if you're trying to partition off your land. And do um, I have a picture of one? I don't. They're also just pretty. I mean, they're, they have ornamental as well as functional um, uses. And this is why they continue being planted um, throughout Europe in the years up until the 17th century. And it's also why uh, settlers coming to the New World brought them with, uh, brought barberry uh, uh, saplings and cuttings and seeds with them. Because this is going to be a real useful plant for, you know, for going off to, to the frontier and starting farming from scratch, right? So, 
the Barbary bush comes to the U.S. as part of the so-called Colombian exchange, right? We're all clear, well, when Columbus gets to the New World, he's not just bringing European culture and technologies to the New World. There's a, there's a give and take as well. The potato, of course, uh, um, originates in uh, the Andes in modern Peru and um, then goes back to Europe and swiftly becomes a major element uh, staple in the diets of many northern Europeans, right? Um, likewise, corn and turkey come from the New World, tobacco, a cocoa, quinine, rubber, and then uh, this this this, this, this change, again this this sort of when the, when the new world is discovered, it opens up new uh, pathways for commodities. In this case, plants uh, to travel across the Atlantic to find a new home uh, here in this country. And in this case, bringing the the disease stem rust with them. Okay. So in the 1700s, we have some records of. Um, sorry, of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island all banned barberry bushes. They're cognizant of the threat that it poses to their cereal crops. Um, and then by the late 19th century, the, the link between barberry and stem rust is pretty much known. I mean, this is, um, and actually scientists are late to the game. It's the farmers who figure out the connection between barberry and plant disease, and then scientific research is conducted on these grounds. By the turn of the century, everyone's pretty much aware that the problem is the barberry bush. This is, the, this is where this disease overwinters. This is uh, sort of at the heart. If, if, if we're going to break this vicious cycle, it's got to happen by, by, by taking out the barberry bushes, right? The problem, though, is that by this point in time, uh, they've been planted widely from colonial times on. Um, they also tend to, the, 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 the um, seeds tend to pick up and fly on air currents pretty well. So there's barberry growing in the wild all throughout the Midwest as well. And so this is... Um, so the, uh, the, the, the prospect of trying to uproot all these bushes is a daunting task. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of money. And nobody's quite, I mean, and the, 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 the problem is known, but the solution is opaque, right? But it's obviously something that has to be done. Nobody's quite sure what that's going to be. As we can see, just in terms of uh, the 19 teens, the harvest in Minnesota and the Dakotas is less by uh, half to a third. So this, this is... Um, one of the worst uh, plant, this is one of the worst plant disease pandemics um, in history going on in the U.S. right on the eve of World War I, okay? Um, let's see, let me stop and see if I have any questions for now, or shall I just keep on going? It just keeps getting better, folks. It just keeps getting better. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So, uh, as of the World War I, stem rust has emerged as the, a, the major threat to American crops. People know why it's there, but they can't quite figure out how to get rid of it. This, the, the, uh, there's no good fungicides as yet. There's no stem rust resistant strains developed as yet. So, it's really, uh, the people aren't sure quite what to do. Enter World War I, right? Now, um, as we all know, the war begins in 1914 in Europe. We don't get drawn into it until 1917. But once we do, we embark on the same type of propaganda offensive that the other combatant powers do, right? We demonize the enemy. Uh, we, uh, sorry, the, 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 the three elements of propaganda that I think matter the most are, are that we demonize the enemy, we uh, use the images of women and children as innocent victims, and we also provide prescriptive uh, uh, tasks telling people what they should do as a result of these things. Right? So for instance, destroy this mad brute, this horrible ape wearing a little Kaiser helmet there, uh, threatening to invade the US, enlist in the, enlist in the US Army. Demonize the enemy, women and children victims, here's what you do to solve it. Likewise, uh, this horrible, uh, gruesome uh, German or Hun, in the common uh, racist term of the time, uh, demonize the enemy, how do we solve it? By liberty bonds, right? So they, uh, although America is late to the propaganda game in World War I, we swiftly catch up to our counterparts in Britain and elsewhere. Um, uh, a bit of a shaming men to join the Navy. I mean, if, if she wants to, come on, guys. You got you to step up and do your share. And then on the right, I think all of these uh, elements come together. You can't quite see it probably from there, but the bottom of the Atlantic is carpeted with the corpses of women and children that the Kaiser is storming across. He brings his bloody shore aboard on the eastern seaboard. Demonize the enemy, women and children as victims. What do you do? Join the Navy, right? Now, the, the, once we get into World War I propaganda, and that's a whole other rabbit hole we can save for another time, we find that it's used to uh, convince people of the necessity of all kinds of different things, not always directly related to the war effort. 
For instance, uh, Knowledge Wins. Go check out books from the library so that we can send other books uh, overseas. I need smokes. Save your cigarettes for our boys in the trenches, right? Relatively, my, checking out books, saving cigarettes. We're far removed from the big picture here of defeating Germany. These are more simple, everyday, prescriptive messages, right? Propaganda is multifarious in this regard. Um, uh, the American propaganda effort is led by the Committee on Public Information, directed by George Creel, an advertising man from... Uh, 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 the, the pre-war times, and part of the means by which American propaganda was spread throughout the country was these so-called Four Minute Men who would um, go to different cities and give four-minute lectures on the necessity of joining World War I and staying with the effort. This is, this is also right when the so-called Spanish flu is booming, so the inadvertent side effect of this propaganda campaign was to spread this disease much further than it would have otherwise. Um, Right, the, the other major pandemic of 1918. Um, but what we find is the war ends, 1918. The CPI is still in effect. And then this, pro as, as I see it, uh, the American popula populace has been primed to receive propaganda messages and act upon them. Uh, even after the war is over, there's still these triggers that we're still ready to follow and obey, right? So, for instance, um, uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's such a depressing photograph in a lot of ways, right? So uh, propaganda works on kids, right? It's strong enough for a man, but made for a child, I guess. Um, and then um, we can use this propaganda mobilizing mentality for any number of different tasks, such as voting on prohibition. Are you going to do the right thing and be a good American patriot and vote for prohibition to get back at all those German breweries? Oh, yeah. Even the choice of drinking or not becomes politicized, propagandized, right? This is the context for uh, the, Barley the Barberry Eradication Program, which runs from 1918 into 1980. So th this is a decades-long attempt to eradicate Barberry from uh, the Western Plains. It's a combination of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and various state extension groups, as well as land-grant colleges. This is a massive effort uh, on the part of all these agencies to um, hire, well, the, the first, they encourage volunteers to go out and do this. They end up relying more on paid labor of uh, putting together teams of uh, men and boys, primarily, to go out in the countryside to find these barberry bushes and, well, get rid of them. Um, to, to get rid of a bush that size would take about 10 to 15 pounds of salt. You could salt the roots or a gallon of uh, kerosene or you dig it out by the roots, right? And this is what ended up happening most places. Um, overall, the, the one number I've seen, and I haven't seen exactly where it's coming from, but according to many accounts, over 500 million bushes were uprooted between 1918 and 1980. Most of them, I mean, sorry, the, the bushes were destroyed. Most of them uprooted, dug up by hand, one by one, right? But in the 1930s, of course, this is another great way to spend all those, all that, all those New Deal funds is you could actually mobilize teams of men to go out in the countryside uh, to wipe out the bushes. But this, is, uh, this would not have been possible, I think, without the propaganda mobilization of World War I because what we see is um, uh, <laughs> in a scientific uh, pamphlet about the barberry, we learn that it is the patriotic duty of every citizen who has any barberries to growing his friends to remove and destroy them. Common berry, but we we cannot justify growing a worthless bush, which is a menace to our food supply. Food supply. Less barberries mean more food for our allies and ourselves. This one is still during World War One, right? There's grain rationing, uh, the, um, so that we can send all that grain to our soldiers in the field. And this is precisely when Stemrust is wiping out over half the crop in the upper Midwest, right? So it is cast as not just a menace to agriculture, but as a menace to the American war effort, right? Um, likewise, here's the, uh, the, 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 the sort of a, a characterizing or portraying uh, stem rust as, as this demonic figure threatening to, uh, to take out our, uh, our crops. Again, urging people to yeah, demonize the enemy. There's a helpless farmer. What do we do? Dig up barberry bushes. The same type of elements we see in World War I propaganda are now being deployed against stem rust. Yes? Next. Whoops. Okay. Okay, the barberry bush is akin to the Kaiser. 
all these 500 million plants that are scattered across the American countryside, it's obviously the Germans up to no good as usual, right? Meanwhile, in this letter to the editor from South Dakota uh, State College of uh, Agriculture and Mechanical Arts, let's see how they decide to portray the stem rust bush. This bush is decidedly pro-German, is decidedly disloyal, but should be treated as a dangerous enemy alien we should instead, and we have to keep it from attacking our patriotic cereal crops. This idiom of patriotism, nationalism, comes wrapped up in telling people to go out and dig up these big old bushes, right? Not surprisingly, come 1918, World War I's over, but there's a new enemy, communism, Bolshevism, right? This is the first Red Scare with the Palmer raids and everything else. The, what was previously uh, Black Stem Rust Demon, um, and previously, Kin of the Kaiser. Where's that one? Kin of the Kaiser. And now, of course, is the Bolsheviks, the anarchists who are uh, coming after our, our grain crops. So the, 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 the specific enemy changes, right? First, it's the, is it some random demon, then the Kaiser, then Bolshevism. But we're just mobilizing the, the, these popular sentiments that Americans have been trained to feel in their attack on this new foe, right? So... In terms of volunteer efforts to combat the barberry bush, there were some, um, there, there were some uh, successful attempts, especially mostly in the 1920s, with there's a uh, Rust Busters Club, similar to uh, the Boy Scouts, uh, where you could join up and you could get a medal for, for finding and reporting uh, barberry bushes. You could also hold a barberry bee, like you were raising a barn or making a quilt. Get all your neighbors together, cover the countryside, trying to dig up barberry bushes. For the most part, though, most of the actual work is done by people paid uh, to go out to the fields um, and uh, scan them by quadrants looking for barberry bushes, and then to go back three or four years later because these are very uh, hardy uh, bushes, and they'll often grow back from even just a fragment of root, right? So this is, um, yeah, the, the, the common barberry bushes are tagged before they're pulled up to, to tell people identify what these plants look like radio programs on uh, the threat posed by uh, stem rust and how we combat it, again, through the barberry eradication program. Um, and this, okay, this is from 1920, and you can see where, I mean, a handful, I mean, just a couple of bushes can give you, can give you, um, the, the, the stem rust can overwinter on barberry, and the next spring come back, let's see, that's a, that's a one mile radius, but you can see where it's gotten into all of the, the neighboring wheat and grain crops. So this is, I mean, the, um, it's, it, it, to me, the, the, the propaganda element of it is uh, a little laughable, it's a little humorous in retrospect as an historian, but this was a genuine and serious threat to American crops. I can't think how else we could have mobilized people to, to go after it, right? So, Cold War, and again, this is where I... Everyone's seen Dr. Strangelove, right? I should hope so. Okay, a great, great film. If you haven't, run out and see it. So remember that the, the, where we started off, where I started off on this rabbit hole, and I'm coming back, bear with me, was what does stem rust have to do with the Cold War? What is the CIA composing a report in 1951 on... Uh, the possible damage to Soviet crops have bombarded with, with stem rust. Well, it turns out that this is exactly what um, we were concerned about. Let's wander back to the 1950s. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the Truman White House. China's just gone communist. Korea is descending into chaos and warfare. And when you go back and read the various uh, uh, national intelligence estimates, NIEs, from 1951-52, the Truman White House is just... Um, really, really concerned about every possible threat to America, including, as we see over here, the Tu-4, the Tupolev-4 bomber, the Soviet's new bomber. They figure that that can probably get as far as Seattle, Oregon, right? That it might be able to attack the Pacific Northwest from bases in, in Kamchatka. Now, it never could, I mean, they, they didn't have the technology until the late 1950s, but again, the Truman White House is both A, very concerned about the communist threat, and B, willing to think really broadly and creatively about ways that we might be able to combat it. We start by figuring out what they might do to us. And this is a list of biological warfare uh, agents most likely to be used against the U.S. Um, by the Soviets. Now, most of them are anti-personnel types of things. Uh, uh, anthrax, um, some form of botulism, Brichella, the 
uh, da, da, what's another familiar one? So mostly along the lines of like bio warfare, nerve gas was also a popular one that we wanted to, to, to do more research on. But in the, uh, for NIE 18, for the part on crop bio warfare, we've got Putina graminis, that is stem rust. We identify it as one of the major threats the Soviets might be able to bombard our crops with and attack our food supply, right? Um, not surprisingly, then, we go ahead and figure out how we can then turn, how we could then use stem rust against our Soviet foes. Now, um, so what follows are a couple of excerpts from this 1951 study. Um, so in case one, they're looking at how they're trying to uh, calculate the spread of stem rust from dropping bombs, and they're uh, talking about, and the, the way they do so, the way they, the way they go about doing this math, is they go back and look at prior incidences of Barbary Bush infection during the 1920s and 30s, right? So it's the information that we gain in the course of combating stem rust at home that we then try to weaponize to attack the Soviets abroad. Right? That is, um, we tested one munition at Pine Camp, probably Pine Bluffs, Arkansas. That's one of the nine uh, American arsenals that have bio or chemical warfares at the time. Uh, and we see that we have um, it, uh, managed to spread inoculum over uh, 25 square miles. Previous um, uh, outbreaks of barbary suggested even greater spread of the uh, disease. That is, we, that as far as we can tell from the testing, it's looking as though uh, we could use stem rust bombs to wipe out much of the crop in Ukraine and elsewhere. Now, nobody seemed to stop and think that maybe 25 million starving Ukrainians with AK-47s was a bad idea. That would be my major concern. They're probably going to head west and invade Europe, right? But the point is that we're, we're thinking through, I mean, in terms of this sort of like, Every, throwing everything possible we can at the problem, whatever type of attacks we might try and come up with, stem rust was the one crop bio-warfare element that immediately surfaced in the minds of the CIA, right? That is, that it, um, uh, the, 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 it's, the, I, I would, I, I mean, I suspect both given our experience of combating stem rust, we knew how bad it would be, and we had also generated all this information about the disease in the course of combating it in the 20s and 30s. So in essence, from, from an information warfare standpoint, we're taking plowshares, converting them into swords. Are you with me? Sort of these peacetime applications of science to combat the disease can then be weaponized to use it against our foes. Now, by the late 1950s, the, 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 the uh, US foreign policy establishment isn't freaking out as much. Korea's stabilized. Um, not much else is happening at this point. So as a result, this, this was never used. We, we, we never actually bombarded uh, the Soviet bloc with um, plant diseases, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, nor, for that matter, did we use biowarfare in any other uh, context I'm aware of. There's, the, there's the, some accusations of using nerve gas in Korea, then of course Agent Orange in Vietnam. But so the, um, I, I just in, in, full, in terms of full disclosure, this was only ever on the planning boards. It was never actually executed as an attack on the Soviet Union, right? Um, but um, th uh, even though the stem rust itself wasn't ever used to bombard the Soviet Union, it turns out that the, that the delivery mechanism uh, ends up being very useful down the road. The way that they envision dropping stem rust um, uh, disease on um, foreign targets, I mean, you can't just drop a bomb uh, that explodes because that's not going to spread the disease much. What you want is a bomb that's going to uh, uh, detonate at altitude and then scatter it over a large um, uh, uh, area of land, right? This was the origins of the E-73 feather bomb. Uh, they found that one of the best things to uh, keep stem rust um, inoculum on were turkey feathers. So we had bombs that were stuffed full of turkey feathers contaminated with stem rust that we intended to drop over over the Eastern Bloc. Now, we never actually do so, but this basic, uh, the, 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 this basic type of bomb uh, is in modern times called the cluster bomb. That is the, a bomb that detonates at altitude and then scatters smaller bomblets all over the countryside below. In Afghanistan, they're often brightly colored in yellow and children would pick them up and lose an arm or a leg as a result. But the, the point is that the, the delivery uh, technology, the feather bomb, does find its way into modern warfare as the M115 cluster bomb. Uh, for what it's worth, again, sort of this, this uh, the, the, when, when we weaponize information, we can we can get up we can come up with all sorts of new and different things. 
what have we left? Okay, so let me go ahead and, um, da, 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 oh, skipped one. Okay, so we never actually use it. The research does come in handy for at least figuring out this new type of bomb. Oh, uh, then uh, during the 19, um, again, the, the, the BEP program runs until 1980. As late as the 50s and 60s, you've got, oh, uh, let's see, this is a report of government agents going out to survey uh, the Sherman Ranch in, I think, Washington. And they, they, they indicate all the places that they find barberry bushes, some planted deliberately, some wild uh, seedlings. And they go back a couple of different times, 59, 65, 74, trying to... Uh, making sure that those, those plants haven't come back. They also, incidentally, uh, report on the attitude of the owner. Despite having the government come storming through his backyard every decade, his attitude is still good. All right, so a weird little, <laughs> weird little document here. Um, okay, so to, the, 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 the ways that we... The, to come back to Barbary's uses, by the 20th century, it's really more an ornamental shrub than anything else, right? So the, uh, the, the Japanese barberry is uh, closely related. Um, however, it does not serve as a host for stem rust. So one of the major uh, drives for getting rid of the common barberry back in the 20s and 30s was just use the Japanese barberry instead. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just as pretty, and it doesn't, and it doesn't uh, perpetuate this, this plant disease uh, throughout the countryside. The problem is that it is an invasive uh, crop, so it tends to wipe out native crops. Meanwhile, the barberry bush itself, um, in England, is the only host for a certain type of uh, endangered moth. Um, in this country, it still can overwinter stem rust. It also turns out that this uh, bush, with its prickly thorns and spines, is a great home for mice who carry ticks, who carry various diseases themselves. So. The war with Barbary is not over <laughs> yet. It's merely changed a bit. And in modern times, especially from 1999, there are modern stem rust variants uh, that, 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 sorry, that, that, that originate in, in uh, Uganda. That this UG99 is its label. And this stem rust is resistant to um, the fungicides we have. It's uh, the, the various stem rust resistant uh, plant strains that we've developed are doing any good against this one. So it's spreading throughout Africa. And it got to Sicily in 2016. So um, uh, even, even to this day, really more recently, the last 20 years or so, stem rust has resurfaced as a major threat to, to world crops. Right. The, no, so this is just this is pointing out that the stem rust can also spread as a, um, uh, a radiospore. That is... Um, Although it relies heavily on overwintering on the uh, barberry bush, it can also spread like a regular plant disease as well. This is why uh, the new strains are so virulent. They've managed to uh, cut the barberry bush out of their life cycle and just spread pretty much wildly across um, Africa and now Europe as well. So what? What does any of this have to do with anything? Well, I think plant diseases matter. I think they're important. And I think it's useful to... Uh, ask questions about uh, uh, about their effect and impact upon history um, and uh, upon mankind. Again, it's been around since, since the earliest evidence of uh, human social organization on this planet. We found stem rust spores on that pottery. We've seen how it was an element of Roman religion, and which is then appropriated by the early church. We saw how it came across the uh, uh, the Atlantic as part of the Columbian as part of the Columbian Exchange, and then um, the almost wiped. I mean, wiped out a significant. It, it, it's probably the worst plant disease in our country's history, just for what it's worth in terms of overall plant damage. I can't think of a worse one. Um, I think it makes us also think more about globalization. That is, how do we stop this disease from spreading when we live in such a globalized world? And this, this, this I mean, not to, not to dwell upon current events too much, but one of the real problems with the ongoing uh, Russian assault on Ukraine is that Ukraine is the world's breadbasket. I mean, this is where if Ukraine can't, can't export crops, most of those crops are, are bought up by the WHO to feed people in Africa. So among all the other horrible things about what Russia is doing in Ukraine right now, Africa is going to starve because they're not going to be able to get these crops. Plant diseases matter. Crops matter. Globalization matter. Next, um, 
I'm being kind of ironic here, three cheers for big government. I mean, most of us don't, aren't huge fans of that. But the one way this was going to get done was with a massive government program with massive inputs of technology and manpower over the course of decades, right? So this is where I think we have to, um, we, 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 can be, we can be wary of propaganda all we want to as it tends to keep people from thinking straight or brainwashing them. But in this case, it's a pretty good message that we're communicating. So I'm saying in this particular case, I'm all for big government, I'm all for government propaganda because it worked this time when it was really important to do so. Um, more broadly, uh, let's see, for, uh, Braudel. Fernand Braudel is a French historian who's uh, writing in around World War II just afterwards. And he argues that to do history properly, we have to look in terms of, we, we have to think about how we move the bookends, right? We can look at the history of the event or événement, sort of things happening right then. Or we can look at sort of like the medium duration or the moyenne durée in France, that is uh, cycles of 50 to 100 years. Or we can take the long durée, that is the long time span, where we look at things that occur over the span of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years. I think this is one of those things that uh, the history of STEM rust and humankind encourages us to do so, right? It, 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 it almost forces us to think out of our box of what history and what types of history matter and instead count and so they're this, this thousands-year-long trajectory. I mean, the part I'm focusing on is just the Cold War. One report, 1951, some testing by 1953. Three years total in, in history that, I mean, that it turns out goes back for, for, for thousands and thousands of years. And this is, I mean, this is, to me, in approaching this topic and thinking about it more, I mean, again, it, it's been a chance to kind of reflect on what I do as a historian, right? We can focus on the very uh, small picture, but if we do so, I think we're missing out on the, the centuries-long history of this serial killer and scene. Thank you all for your time.